our, our job, our role, our religious life is founded on the idea that we come into this church to embody the world as we hope it will one day become. It's called the beloved community. It's, Jesus called it the kingdom of heaven on earth. We come here to embody and incarnate and give flesh to that vision. You and I can't go out and just change the world overnight. We can't just change everything. It's not going to happen in any one of our lifetimes. But we can come in here every week and we can be that community. We can be the world as we hope it would become. We can imagine from a God's eye view what would community look like? What would neighborhoods look like and nations in the and the neighborhood of the world look like? How would people act? How would they love each other? How would they care for each other? How would they stumble over their differences and find their commonalities? And our job is to come in here every week and embody that possibility as an example to the rest of the world, like a light unto the nations of, of all the world, right? So we need to be that model, how we act and how we are in this place. So let us, let us go forth in the future knowing that our job is set out before us to embody this world as we hope it will one day become, if not in our lifetime, maybe in our children's, our grandchildren's, or our great-grandchildren's lifetimes. I want to I wanna direct your attention to this picture, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. This painting is called Simple Gifts, Simple Gifts 2, and it is, it, I had an artist, Pat Gordon, who's a member of this church, he painted it on watercolors, and you can see the original out the door to your right when you walk out of the sanctuary, if you haven't seen it. It's beautiful. And I asked him to put in objects that describe the, the theology and the history and the, the values of this church. And I want to describe it to you this morning. So we're going to kind of build the picture back together, if you will. And if we could, if we could start with the very first piece, the foundation of this painting is this table from the Revolutionary War era in the United States. The people who created this free church tradition in the United States were some of the same people who wrote the Declaration of Independence and signed it and fought in the Revolutionary War. That's when it came to the United States. It had been in Europe for a few hundred years. It formed during the Protestant Reformation at the time in Europe when Luther was arguing with the Pope, and then Calvin came and he argued with the Pope too and with Luther, and all these people were arguing with each other. Pretty soon they started killing each other, and at that time, this free faith that we embody here in this church was formed back in the 16th century in Europe. But here in America, it emerged during the Revolutionary War time. People like Thomas Jefferson, he, was, he attended a Unitarian church when he was, whenever he was in Philadelphia, very involved, wrote about it. Uh, um, Benjamin Rush, a Universalist, who signed the, the Declaration of Independence as well as Jefferson. Both Adams presidents, Sam and John, Sam and John Quincy Adams. Did I say Sam Adams? You can tell what I want to do when this is all over. <laughs> John Adams and John Quincy Adams. And Sam, too. I'm sure he was a Unitarian. <laughs> so where was I? The foundation, the, the, the historic foundation of this church came out of that period when freedom, freedom of thought, freedom against all kinds of tyrannies, whether it was the king or whether it was the pope or whether, whatever it was that was telling people, you can't be who you want to be, you can't be who you think you should be, you can't be what you really believe you are, you need to do what we say you need to do. That's when they said, forget it. They said it politically, forget it. We're going to create our own nation then, and we're going to govern it ourselves. We don't need kings. And he said, we're going to create our own church. We don't need popes and bishops and all the rest of them because we're smart enough and we're loving enough and we care enough to create our own church. And so the people who threw off the shackles of monarchy also threw off the shackles of papacy, and they said, we're going to have a free church grounded in democracy. 
grounded in intelligence and rational thinking as well as love and faith. And so they did. And that happened in America in, in around the same time as the revolution by some of the same people. As a matter of fact, during the Revolutionary War, there were a couple of uh, chaplains. One was a Unitarian, another Universalist. And there were some folks in the army who wanted them to be kicked out because they didn't follow you know, exact scripture the way that some of the others felt they should. And George Washington himself stood up and said, absolutely not. They want to serve this country, this new country we're building, and they belong as well as anyone else. So from the very beginning, George Washington was involved as well, knew who we were, knew what we were about, and said, absolutely, that's part of the fabric of what this new nation is going to be. And so that's why we have the table as the first object. If we could keep building this picture, well, I'll show you the next one. It's not going to surprise you. It's the Bible. The foundation theologically of this church is the Bible, right? I told you about Luther and Calvin and all these arguments going on in Europe during the Protestant Reformation. They were arguing over an interpretation of the Bible and, and who, what does the Bible mean and how should we understand it and how should we read it? And so this church for hundreds of years, the Bible was the only scripture that would have been read or looked at and it is absolutely the foundation of this congregation and this tradition. And anyone who, who doesn't know that is thinking about a different church because this church is founded on the, the principles of the Bible as interpreted through reason and faith. And that's what, this church, that's what this church is about. So we start with the foundation of the Bible, centuries and centuries of the Bible. Now, something happened in the 19th century here in America. It was in 1838. And if you'll go to the next object in the painting you'll see a book are we still working together here could you just flip to the next slide you'll see a book by Ralph by Emerson if you could see what it said Ralph Waldo Emerson his father was a Unitarian minister he was a Unitarian minister for many years before he left the ministry and became a philosopher known as the great American philosopher and he gave a sermon at Harvard at the chapel at Harvard University in 1838 called the Divinity School Address where he said no one I'm paraphrasing here no one book can contain all of the truth and all of the wisdom for all times and all cultures and all places that I don't he said whether you're the Bible the Quran you know all these prophets have come all these people have said our book is the final and last book and God stopped speaking and God stopped doing miracles and all these things and he said no it's, this created a huge controversy in, in New England, throughout the land, certainly at Harvard. The, people were saying, what? Is this, this is the great American philosopher, and he's telling us that the Bible isn't the one and only documentation of what's true and real. This was huge. Even within Unitarian churches and universalists, they were arguing over this for, for a couple of generations. But with Emerson, over time, people recognized that the Bible may be our foundation, and it may be a great source of our spiritual wisdom and our hope for the future, but it's not the only one, and that we can learn from other religious paths and other cultures the way God has revealed the truth in other cultures and other times and other places, even to our own time. Emerson said, if you want to see a miracle, just lift your arm. My God, it's a miracle that we're even alive. Look at how the hand works. It's a miracle. We have miracles. They didn't stop. They're still happening. We, we are an embodiment of a miracle, the fact that we're even here. So with Emerson, we, Emerson said, we can understand the truth through our own hearts, through nature, through other cultures and religions. And even you'll even see in this time from, from this pulpit at, at different times, we'll do readings from Alice Walker, people like Maya Angelou. We'll do, you know, because we know that the truth is continually being revealed in different ways through different people, all men and women and children of all ages and all cultures, and that that is the path of, of this church. And so if we'll go to the next slide, you'll see that it's a blank book. It's a journal. It's untitled because it has blank pages because it's still being written. Our understanding of the truth and, and because no book can contain all of the wisdom and all the truth of what we call God or holy or the earth or the world, the universe. We still don't know. Science is still discovering. We're still discovering. That's the beauty of it. That's what makes it so incredible. Let's go to the next uh, object. So this is, a this is a ballot box. We are governed democratically. As I said, you, the congregation elects our ministers. The congregation elects our lay leaders. The congregation votes on the budget and how we spend our money. Right? This is a democratic church, just like 
that this is a democratic nation. Let's continue. The, the next object are hearts. It's the only object that we have two of in the painting, two hearts, and that's because they represent love. That's the most important part of this church. Love is the spirit of this church. That's what we say every Sunday as part of our covenant. Love is the spirit of this place. When all else fails, when we're not sure which way to go, we're not sure how to interpret, we're not sure what to do, we're not sure who, who to believe or who to be, we always just turn to love. We know that love will always guide us. Love will always show us the right way. That's what Jesus said, but, and that's what we all know deep in our hearts, that we just need to say, I'm not sure which thing to do. What's the loving thing to do? And, that's, and so love is the spirit of this place, and our job is to embody that love in our lives, not just in here, but out in the world as much as we can. What's next? The Statue of Liberty represents freedom. That's the foundation of, of this nation, but also this church. Freedom to believe, right? How many of you think if Bill would have given that message in a different church this morning here in Oklahoma, he might have gotten stoned by the congregation? Some people might have walked out and left. He, he questioned some things that he had learned in his upbringing. He questioned some things about the Bible and what he was taught about God. And here you can do that. We, we don't all agree with everything that is said or sung every Sunday in this church. But we believe that we're adult enough to decide for ourselves which pieces are true and which pieces are not. It may be a, a, an individual's truth, but it may not be everybody's truth with a big T, and that we can, we can decide that for ourselves, and we trust each other to do that. And that's the, that's the point of this church, is to have freedom. And it's freedom of belief, because there's so many places in, in Oklahoma and around, around the country and the world, but in Oklahoma, where if you say what you really think or believe, somebody may jump on you or start yelling at you or start waving the Bible in front of you and saying, that's not true, this is what it says, this is what you have to believe. But here, in this place, you don't have to do that. You can speak from your heart what you really believe. It may change over time, but, it, but at least you can say it and know that you're at home and know that you're, you're allowed and among, among good people who care about you and the future of this world. So let's keep, let's keep going because it's not just freedom for its own sake. It's freedom in pursuit of justice. The scale represents justice, right? It's not just freedom for our own freedom inside this church, but it's also in the world. And that's why Dr. Wolf and many members of this congregation were marching on the front lines of the civil rights movement. And a lot of those people I mentioned earlier from the Revolutionary War were not fought for the Revolutionary War, and then they or some of their children started to fight for the Civil, civil War, right? And, and for all of the freedoms for, for all people to be fully free. That's the point. It's not just, they say justice is love with legs, right? It's taking the love that we feel and, and making it real in the world out there, not just for us and our families, but for everybody. And so that's really important. It's freedom, but responsibly used freedom. It's not just freedom in a, like anarchy and, and like anybody can do anything. It's freedom used responsibly, using our reason and our conscience to guide us, and, the, and scripture, and the community, and all the things that we have at our disposal. Let's keep going. The flowers, the big bouquet of flowers, they represent us. They represent you. They represent, each flower represents a different person, each one beautiful and a miracle in its own right, in your own right, in our own right. And yet, we come together to create a greater whole and a greater beauty, all diverse, all different, different colors, different theologies, different beliefs, different backgrounds, ethnicities, whatever, you, whatever the differences are. But that's the American ideal, right? On the dollar bill, it says, e pluribus unum. Out of many, we create one. That's what we did in this nation. Out of many nations and peoples and religions, we create one nation, one people. And, and that's what we do in this church is we take all those differences and we create one church and one people. And so the flowers represent the diversity which is us and which is what we're becoming. And what I love about the, the flowers, a couple things that I want you to see is that there's a, oh, you can't see it in this picture because it's a photograph, but it, it, there's a thistle in there. And that's because, you know, there are some prickly people in this <laughs> congregation. And sometimes that prickly person is me, and sometimes it's you, right? But part of it is, it's not that we're all, it's not all saints, church. Remember that. We're not all saints around here. It's all souls, church. All souls. And so we have all different kinds of people, and we're not all perfect. 
And sometimes we're rough on the edges, but we come together to help polish and smooth each other so that we can be the people that we're meant to be and hope to be. Let's keep going. The, the next object is the water. And this represents God. This represents the holy, if you will, in this painting. And let me tell you why. It's what nourishes us, right? It's what, it's what we need to be alive is the holy, the sacred. Some call it the interdependent web of all life. However you name it, whatever name you have for it, the beauty of this symbol in this painting is that it has no color. God has no color. It has no shape. It takes the shape of whatever it's in. And we all know that there can be no life anywhere on the planet, anywhere in the galaxy, anywhere, anywhere without water, right? Water is that source that nourishes and strengthens us no matter what and by whatever name. Let's keep going. The next object is the vase. That it, is, it is this sanctuary is what it represents. It's clear glass, just like we have clear glass in here because even while we're in here in church, we're looking out at the world so that we, are, we never get confused that our religion is in here one hour a week. Our religion is out in the world every hour of every day, how we live our lives and how we love one another and our neighbors and even our enemies, right? That's the idea of the clear glass. It's the church in the picture. It's the place where we come together to be nourished by God and by one another. And so that's, that's the sanctuary. So let's keep going. This vase, the blue and white vase, comes from a village in the Carpathian Mountains, which is now in Romania, it used to be Hungary, where, as I told you, in 1568, Unitarianism became a religion during the Protestant Reformation. I want to tell you a short story about that. This was a time when there was huge fighting, wars between the Catholics and the Protestants, and people were, they were killing Jews. I mean, it was, it was, it was bloody time in Europe, Europe's history. And for a very short time, there was a Unitarian king. His name was John Sigismund in the Principality of Transylvania. And he was, he became a Unitarian during this era. And here's what he did when he took power. He called a council together. It's called the Diet of Turda in 1568. And, and by decree, they decreed religious freedom in their land, in this principality. He said, it doesn't matter if, if you're Catholic, if you're Protestant, what you believe, if, if a preacher can preach whatever that preacher's conscience says that is right, and that if the congregation keeps that that preacher, that minister, then that's the congregation's business. And in a time of great war and strife, this little pocket of free religious freedom emerged in Europe in the 16th century. And I love the fact that the one time and only time in history so far that we had a king, that we had all power, right? The power of the state completely in the hands of one person, and that, that person used it to spread freedom for all people to believe and to love God as they understand God to be. And I think that's a beautiful story for us. Let's keep going. There's a flower in that vase. An individual flower represents the individual members of the church. It represents you. Every one of us comes into the church on our own spiritual journey. We're, we're each on a different walk. We're in a different place in our understanding of, of God, of life, of the universe, of our place in it. And so we're always trying to provide the resources for everybody to, to become whole and one and completely connected on their spiritual path. And so there's, so there's the individual flower and then there's the community. And those are always in tension in this church between what's good for me and what's good for the whole. And we always have to keep that in mind and we always have to remember if, even if it's not our preference or it's not something that's, that feels right to us, is it right for the whole church because that, that's going to take precedent at that time. But there's other times when just one individual needs to stand up and say, I'm sorry, I just can't agree with that this is the direction that this church is taking. And that one person sometimes can guide the church in the, in the right direction. So there's always a tension. We're a check and a balance on each other, the individual and on the community. And so it's an incredible thing, and everyone is on their own path. And let's go. We just got two more. This dead oak leaf represents what we heard Barbara say in the prayer, the mighty cloud of witnesses, those people who've come before us who may not be alive, who we might not be able to see with our outward eyes, but who still remain within our hearts and inspire us to keep doing and being who we are. It's the people whose shoulders we stand upon in this life. It's the people, whether they're our ancestors 
or our religious forebears or the people who founded this church, even though they're, they may be gone from this world physically, they're still surrounding us like a mighty cloud of witnesses cheering us on, making sure that we keep going in the right path and in the right way of freedom and love and unity among all the diversity of the world. And finally, we have the falling leaf. It's green and it's shining, it's alive. It represents life, it represents our lives, but also represents, he, the artist made it falling to remind us of our mortality, that we are only here for a short, precious amount of time on this earth, in this world, in this life. Let us use this time that we have to develop a deeper relationship with ourselves and one another and our creator and our understanding of who, who am I? And, and may I be someone who brings more love, freedom, justice, and unity among all the diversity of this world together. And that's our job, you and I. If you want to go to the last slide, it just shows the whole thing put together. Simple gifts, we call it. Simple gifts because it is these things you can't buy at a store. The only way that these can be real in the world is if people get together and make them real. There's no freedom unless people make freedom happen. We're seeing it happen in the Middle East right now. We saw it happen in this country years and years ago, and we still see it happening in this country, right? That's how these things are bought, not with, not with money, but with people's sacrifice and people saying, I want to make sure there's freedom. I want to make sure there's justice. I want to make sure that every person is honored no matter who they are and what they believe or what they look like or what they're doing in their lives, that every person belongs so that our job is to embody that, those values, to incarnate those values, if you will, to give flesh to what are otherwise just ideas. Love's an idea. Freedom's an idea until people, real people, guard it, protect it, and fight for it. And that's what we do here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, every week, every day, every year, is make sure that there is a place of freedom and love for all souls. God bless you. Amen.